Metals make up the bulk of the periodic table. Here the metals are shown in purple, non-metals are shown in green, and metalloids are shown in pink. So what makes a metal? Properties of metals? Well, they're shiny, or they're lustrous. They're able to conduct heat and electricity. They're malleable, which means they're able to be beaten into shape. And they're also ductile, can be drawn out into a wire. So if an element on the periodic table has those properties, they're metals. If they do not have those properties or do not have all those properties, they're metalloids or non-metals. So let's look at some real life examples of some metals. So here we have the metal copper. You can see that in some parts the copper metal is very shiny, but also in some parts the copper metal is very dull. And the reason why the copper metal is very dull is because it's reacted with the oxygen in the air. And if I grab a knife, a very sharp knife, I can actually scratch away a lot of that surface of the copper and underneath I can expose the shiny copper that hasn't reacted with the air. All right, so copper is actually a shiny metal but after a while it does react with the oxygen in the air. And what I have here Oops, where's the camera? This is an example of where copper can be seen in real life. So here we have an electrical wire and inside the plastic coating you can see that there's long thin strips of copper. And why do we have long thin strips of copper in this electrical wire? Because copper is very good at conducting electricity and copper is also very cheap so you can make lots of these and lots in a very long lengths. So if we go back to our properties of metals, copper is shiny, even though sometimes the surface reacts with oxygen. It is able to conduct heat and electricity. It is malleable. So let me show you what I mean by malleable. Here I can have my copper and I can bend it quite easily. So I can actually put a crease in the copper wire. I can do that quite easily and it has not broken the copper and it has not split it in half. All right, so that's what is meant by malleable. So the words used there are able to be beaten into shape. Now I probably didn't beat it into shape but hopefully the idea that I could twist and form that copper metal into any types of shape that I like sort of demonstrates to you what is meant by malleable. And ductile, which means it can be drawn out into a wire and we saw that it is ductile, it can be drawn into a wire because copper is the type of metal we find in our electrical wires. So let's have a look at another metal. Here we have some aluminium. Now aluminium is also a very good example of a metal. It's shiny. Aluminium can also conduct electricity. Aluminium is malleable. So just in the same way I could beat or move the copper into shapes, into, into certain shapes, I can do the same with my aluminium. And it's also ductile, so I, I could technically draw that out into a wire if I had the right machinery. And a great example of where we can see aluminium is over here. So there's the groundsman's shed, and the roof of that structure is made out of aluminium sheeting. A great example of aluminium in the real world. Let's have a look at another metal. Now this metal here is sodium, okay, and sodium is a bit different to aluminium and, co and copper in the fact that this sodium needs to be kept in a very special way. If I open up this container of sodium inside, I'm not sure how well we can see that, but inside there's the sodium metal and it's actually stored says here in liquid paraffin and that's to protect the sodium metal. Now why does the sodium metal need protecting? It's very reactive. Sodium is in the first group on the periodic table which means it's a very reactive metal. It wants to react with oxygen in the air. Sodium will also react very easily with water. So let's get out a piece of sodium metal.
So here's our sodium metal. Now you can see that that there is not very shiny, like, it's, uh, like we said that metals need to be. Now why is it not very shiny? Well, because it's reacted with the oxygen in the air. Now what I'll do, I'll cut the sodium metal in half. It's very difficult to do one-handed. Maybe I need to just do that again. A little bit difficult to see there but what's happened is the inside of that sodium metal where it has not been exposed to the oxygen in the air is very very shiny so the reason why we're not able to see it on this side is because the the, the, the sodium had reacted with the air but we were able to see it on this side okay where it was not exposed to the air now the most common example of sodium in the real world probably for us is this stuff, table salt, sodium chloride. So let's have a look at some sodium chloride. Now, <clears throat> sodium chloride, obviously it's sodium in an ionic bond with chlorine. So it's not just pure sodium metal, but it is probably the most common place we'll find sodium. Okay, so you can see the little ionic crystals of sodium chloride. And this is just regular table salt, same stuff probably most of us have at home. Let's have a look at another example of a metal, tin. And I've got two, two different examples of tin. Here we have, so I've poured some of this tin onto this watch glass. Here we have some pieces of metal tin. Sorry, of, of, of small pieces of tin. Note as well, it's shiny. Same way I could do it with the uh, aluminium and the copper. I can bend this quite easily with my fingers. So it's malleable. It's also ductile, so it can be drawn into a wire. And it can also conduct electricity. Now in here, in this old bottle, we have some powdered tin. So small pieces of tin, and then we have some powdered tin. Now, where is probably a great example of us seeing tin in everyday life? Well, let's go back to our PowerPoint. A great example of where we'd see tin in everyday life is probably not existing all by itself, but probably existing with copper. So a mixture of tin and copper creates what we call an alloy. And the alloy that's probably, well, the most famous example is bronze. So in this photo here, we can see some bronze ax heads. Let's have a look at another example of a metal. This one's iron. These are iron filings, only very small amounts of iron here. And here's a good example of where we can see iron in our day-to-day -day lives. So the school tripods, this one's been burnt, put through the Bunsen burner far too many times, but this is a great example of, of an iron object. Now the legs have been actually painted black but you can see the iron up the top here okay and this iron has been burnt a whole lot but if i was to scrape that away you'd be able to see the shiny surface now where's iron used in day-to-day -day life as well in steel in the alloy steel so steel is made from iron and carbon let's have a look at another example of a metal zinc we have some strips of zinc. So I can, there's a large bit. I'm gonna bend this. This one's a little bit harder to bend. That can still be bent, shiny, malleable, ductile. Now where can we see zinc in our day-to-day -day lives? Well, the alloy brass is made up of copper and zinc. And here we can see some brass instruments all right, so zinc is used in the alloy brass. Let's have a look at a final example of a metal. It's right here. This is my crucifix that I wear around my neck. Now this 
is an example of sterling silver. Right, so this cross is made of sterling silver. Now what does it mean to be sterling silver? Well, sterling silver is another example of an alloy. So here we can see another object that's made from sterling silver. It's a jug or a pitcher. And sterling silver is made up of 92% silver and 8% nickel. So this object over here, it's made up of 92% silver and 8% nickel. And you can see that mine, my crucifix, is probably not quite as shiny as the picture in the, in the image. The picture jug that I showed you just before, that's because this crucifix has reacted with the air, it's oxidized a little bit. So it's a little bit dull, but I could quite easily clean that up. Now you might be thinking to yourself, well, sir, did you get ripped off when you bought that cross? Because you, got, you didn't get 100% silver. You got sterling silver, which is 8% nickel. Well, you've got to then think to yourself, well, what's the purpose of these alloys? What's the purpose of zinc and tin and lead being used in those alloys I just showed you? What's the purpose of nickel being used in this sterling silver cross? Well, it's to give the, um, the product better properties. So this sterling silver cross, well, you're right, it's not 100% silver. It, the, the, that in the nickel actually makes it much stronger, which means that it's going to last longer than if it was just 100% silver. Silver all by itself is quite soft, but adding in that 8% metal, 8% nickel, makes it much stronger.